Hello everyone, welcome to my next lesson on practical coastal navigation. First, I need to state my standard disclaimer. These navigation videos are for educational and explanatory purposes only. They are not intended to guarantee your safety on the water. Nothing, including these videos, can take the place of accredited courses from qualified instructors and developing your own navigation skills over time. You are responsible for choosing destinations and cruising areas that are within your own level of experience and ability. Any charts you may see in this video are not for navigation purposes. They may be out of date and they are for explanation purposes only. When you go out on the water, you are enjoying yourself at your own risk. In the last lesson, we looked at tide heights and how to read the tide tables in the tides and currents tables published annually by the Canadian Hydrographic Service. In the last lesson, we saw that the Canadian Hydrographic Service annually publishes the tides and currents tables that you can download from their website. The tide tables provide the times and heights of the highest and lowest tides for every day in the year. The heights are given in both feet and meters. You can also interpolate between the high and low tides to determine intermediate heights. But what happens in between the high and low tides? When the tide is flooding or ebbing, there's a lot of water that has to move around, and you can get some very strong currents in narrow passes. We often need to get through these passes, for example, to get in and out of the Gulf Islands, and the strong currents can make this very difficult, dangerous, or even not possible. So we need to find the safest times to get through these passes. Let's look at how it all works. We also saw this picture in the last lesson. It tells us where the primary reference stations are located for both the tide tables and the current tables. This is volume 5, which covers Georgia Strait. The inset on the lower left shows the regions covered by volume 6 and 7. The tide floods in from the Pacific and flows up into Georgia Strait from the south. It also flows down into Desolation Sound from the north. So these Gulf Islands tend to act like a large dam, and the water builds up height within the Gulf Islands, and then it pushes out through these small passes. So a flood tide spills out through these passes and into Georgia Strait. Then when the next high tide is reached, the currents all stop flowing and turn to the opposite direction. When the tide is ebbing, then it pushes back through these passes again to flow from Georgia Strait back into the Gulf Islands, and then back out one to Fuca Strait. There are also other passes through which there can be a lot of current. For example, when the tide is flooding, there's a lot of water that has to get through first and second narrows to fill up the entire Indian arm, or empty it out again when it's ebbing. All the primary current stations are marked in this picture as small black squares. We also saw this table of contents in the last lesson. This directs us to the starting page for both the tide height reference stations and the currents reference stations. Here is a typical page of the tables for a typical pass. The name of the pass is shown at the top of the page. Also shown is that the times are all given in standard sun time for the time zone. This time zone is Pacific Standard Time, or UTC-8. The times given in these tables never switch from sun time to daylight savings time and back again. They're all in standard sun time. So if you're using these tables in the summer and daylight savings is in effect, you always need to add an hour to these times to get to your local time. As I mentioned in the last lesson as well, I always instruct my students that if they're asked to look up the time for the next tide turn, look up the time, add the hour, and then always reply with the words daylight savings time. That just saves confusion and no one has to ask, did you add the hour? Okay, as I've already indicated, whenever a high tide or a low tide is reached, the current stops and then turns to the opposite direction. When the current stops flowing to turn back to the opposite direction, that's when it's safe to get through these passes, because that's when there's zero current. 
there can be some residual back eddies and whirlpools, but the turns are the safe times to transit these narrow passes. And that is the information we want to get from the current tables. We want the times of the turns when it's safe to get through these passes. It doesn't matter if it's turning from a high tide to an ebb or a low tide to a flood. Both are safe times to transit a pass. Of course, at a low tide, you may have to worry about shallow areas and rocks, but that's a separate concern. You need to check your charts for that information. Let's take a close look at the information given for a typical pass on a typical day, such as Porlier Pass between Galliano and Maine Islands. Here's a close-up of the entry for August 1st for Porlier Pass. As I also mentioned in the last lesson, if it's the start of the season, your memory may be a little fuzzy about exactly what information is contained in these tables, because you haven't used them for a while. To remind yourself, always look at the column headers. The column headers tell you exactly what information is provided in the tables. The headers alternate between English and French, but they contain the same information, and each day also has the abbreviation of the day in English and French. For each day, the current tables publish the times of the turns when there's zero current in these passes. And these times are shown in bold letters to clearly indicate this is the key information you need to safely transit a pass. So on August 1st, there are four turn times shown, but only two of these times are useful because they're in daylight hours. The two turns of interest on this day are 12.32 Daylight Savings Time and 15.49 Daylight Savings Time. When you're planning your trip, you need to consider which of these times better suits when you can arrive at the pass, and then how far you need to go to get to your destination after transiting the pass. If you're departing Vancouver to go into the Gulf Islands, you need to plan a departure time that will get you to Portier Pass around 12.30 in the afternoon. That will also leave you several hours to get to a nearby anchorage. If you're returning to Vancouver, you may choose to go out of the islands the day before and anchor in Silver Bay or Nanaimo Harbor, since the first available time to get through a pass on August 1st is already the afternoon, and you still have a long straight crossing ahead of you. So, when using these tables, you don't really need any more information than this. The tables tell you the safe times to get through a pass. And if you always go through a pass at the time of the turn, you'll always be safe. However, there is additional information provided in these tables, and that information can help you refine your planning. So, let's look at what happens to the current after a turn. That's what the next two columns of the tables tell you. The next two columns give you a time and maximum speed for the current. After the turn at 12.32 Daylight Savings Time, there will be a maximum current of 2.9 knots at 14.54 Daylight Savings Time. That's not very much, but at other times there can be maximum currents of 7, 8, or 9 knots. If the currents will be very strong, they will build up very fast, and on those days, you need to transit a pass very close to the time of the turn. You won't make it through going against the current, and it can be very dangerous to even try to go with the current. But the next question is, in which direction is the current? Here the current has a negative sign. A negative sign indicates it's an ebb current. Positive sign is a flooding current. So that means the turn at 12.32 daylight savings time will be at a high tide because the current will then turn to an ebb. But maybe again, it's the start of the boating season. You haven't been out for a while and you don't recall which direction an ebb tide flows through Parlier Pass. First, you can look at the bottom of the tables. It tells you that the direction of the flood tide is 30 degrees true. So that's approximately east, which means the flood tide flows east through the pass and out into Georgia Strait. You can also check your chart for this information. Here is the chart for Parlier Pass. These two arrows show the directions of the current. The arrow with the feathers is the direction of the flood current. Think feathers for flood to remind you which arrow shows the flood tide direction. The other arrow without the feathers is the direction of the ebb tide. So, if you're planning to enter the Gulf Islands on this day, August the 1st, arriving early may not help you much because you'd be going against a flood tide. But being a little late won't hurt too much because in this example, on this day, the ebb current will not be very strong and it can help carry you through the pass.
Here's another arrow in the middle of Georgia Strait, and it shows the speed of the current beside it. There will also be a current in Georgia Strait when the tide is flooding or ebbing, but since the strait is many miles across, the speeds there are not very significant. It's not a narrow pass. But if you're about to make a long crossing of Georgia Strait, you may wish to take the current into account. Let's say there is a large change in the tide, and you will spend maybe four hours crossing the strait. You could end up four nautical miles north or south of your planned destination if there's a one nautical mile current. And you may wish to plan to head south or north respectively to take that current into account. Or on other days, half your crossing may be in a flood tide and the other half in an ebb tide. So you may choose to plan a direct course across the strait. Okay, before we end this lesson, let's take a look at secondary current stations. There were primary and secondary stations for tide heights that we looked at in the last lesson, and there are secondary current stations as well. Page 118 in Volume 5 provides a description of how to determine the information for secondary current stations, which are contained in Table 4 on page 129 in Volume 5. First, look up the secondary station in Table 4. For example, this River Jordan is a secondary station that references the primary station of Juan de Fuca East. You can look up the times of the turns and maximum rates for the primary reference station Juan de Fuca East. Then apply these corrections for the River Jordan. There is a time correction for the turn from an ebb to a flood, which would be at a low tide, and one for the turn from a flood to an ebb, which is at a high tide. And there are time corrections for the time of the maximum rate of flood and for the time of the maximum rate of ebb. Look up these times for the primary reference station for the day in question, then apply these time corrections for the River Jordan. And for this secondary station, George Tillicum Bridge, there is a time correction for the high and low waters at the Victoria primary tide station, and only maximum flood and ebb rates given in knots. Then for other stations, you can determine the maximum flood as a percentage of the maximum rate of flood you look up in the primary current reference station, such as 70% for the River Jordan, and then look up a percentage of the maximum rate of ebb. Apply these percentages to the maximum flood and ebb rates you find for the primary station for the day in question. All a little confusing, maybe, but if you're ever at one of these secondary stations and need to look up this information, carefully read page 118 again to make sure you understand how to apply the corrections from Table 4. Okay, so that's the end of this lesson. I hope that was all clear.